I get to talk about brown marmorated stink bug quite a bit, um, but to put a little bit of an ornamental and uh, tree focus on it puts a little bit more pressure on me, I'm not going to lie, but hopefully you'll find that um, it's uh, chock full of good information that you guys are able to take home with you today. So let's start off by raising your hand who's heard of brown marmorated stink bug. Okay, so keep your hands up. If you're from Cook County, go ahead and put them down. Uh, Lake County, Kane County, DuPage, uh, Will, Kane. Where are you from in the back? Winnebago. I don't think I've got a confirmation from there. Have you seen one in your area? <laughs> oh, okay. Well, here we go. Um, this is a pest that's really um, pretty well known, and it's kind of a celebrity. <laughs> you laugh, but you know, it's got websites, it's got videos, its own video series, it's known well around the world, you know, who wouldn't like this little creature to hang out with? I mean, it's got paparazzi following him everywhere. But all in all, I mean, this is a very serious pest um, across so many different commodities. And when Andy um, had originally asked me to talk about this, she said, you know, it has such a wide focus, I think there'll be a lot of interest in a couple different ways, and we'd appreciate if you'd come up. But um, this is a pest that um, is native to Asia, and it's actually been um, around um, the U.S. for quite some time. And it was originally discovered in Pennsylvania in 1998, just purely incidental. And, um, you know, as they've gone back and um, analyzed, you know, and looked over things, they think that um, the, the original or initial U.S. introduction um, came from China and most likely in shipping containers, which is a lot of um, our invasive pests come from or come in. And with my... Um, job, I take a lot of uh, unknown pests that are coming over in lots of different ways, and it's literally looking for needles in haystacks. We're looking for um, bark beetles, we're looking for things in orchards, in grapes, um, vineyards, you know, all different kinds of things. When, you know, with a pest like the brown marmorated stink bug, this fits right into our wheelhouse of things we're looking for. But when this was originally found in Pennsylvania, it kind of got the brush off. They're like, you know, it's just another hemipteran, it's just a stink bug. It probably really isn't of any economic importance. Um, and as we <laughs> have found out, it's actually not a pest in Asia, and it's kind of known as an outbreak pest. And um, it may reach economic levels every couple months, or, or it could go several years before it really um, flares up in its country of origin. So, to get started with, and um, we want to know where is it at in Illinois. And over time, we've actually seen it spread through the U.S. fairly quickly. And this map not only shows the distribution, but it also kind of shows um, the abundance or density of the pest in the U.S. as well. And so here we have the mid-Atlantic states, and this is where it is most widely known. It's having um, the biggest impact in lots of different types um, of industry. And over the past couple of years, it's really beginning to spread out. And it's a highly mobile pest. It's great at hitchhiking. And so you can see why it would move quickly across the country. And we actually have some of our more um, higher densities over on the west coast um, there in the northwest. But um, if you can't see the colors, all the states in green, which is almost all of our um, continental U.S. states have some form of an official detection of brown marmorated stink bug found there. And we move um, up to um, the light yellow where it's considered a nuisance pest. Then the orange indicates it's both an agricultural and nuisance problem. And then the red being um, where the densities are the highest and it's the most severe in both um, agricultural and nuisance issues being reported. So what's its status here in the state of Illinois? And we actually had um, our first two interceptions in December of 2009, which looking back, is, it feels so long ago now. But um, it's really, they're kind of interesting stories. Our first interception was um, 
brought actually into the Illinois Natural History Survey where I'm housed, of, housed out of at the University of Illinois. And it came out of our Champaign County Master Naturalists. Um, his wife had, or, had ordered earrings out of Maryland, and it's, um, boy, I forget the company now, but they kind of take leaves and gold plate them, and it's just kind of a real interesting type of jewelry store. Well, she ordered some jewelry. It got shipped out in a nice little cardboard box, and he opened it up and out crawled this bug. And it was still alive, but I got to give him props because he just happened to read an off-the-wall story out of the East Coast about it. And he brought it in. He goes, I think I have a brown marmorated stink bug. And we're just like, okay. <laughs> and sure enough, he did, and, um, which was our first interception. And then just a couple months later, um, I was contacted by the University of Kentucky. They had um, a sample sent to them out of a warehouse in southeastern Illinois. Um, they'd sent it over to Lexington. And they're like, you know, we're pretty sure it's brown marmorated stink bug. We confirmed it through our entomologist. I just wanted to let you know. So we're like, okay, yes, we know these things move. And now we know these things are moving to Illinois and potentially through Illinois. Our first find within the state, um, within an actual um, neighborhood, if you will, came out of Cook County in September 2010. And this was just a little boy was riding his bicycle down the sidewalk and found this bug and brought it to his mom, who happened to be in the know too. And um, we got that confirmed. And then soon after that, we start seeing a little bit um, more frequent calls, emails, um, and such. Um, January of 2011 marks a pretty significant um, mark, you will, in history for a brown marmorated stink bug here in Illinois. This was our first, if you want to call it, um, potential breeding population within the state. I received an email from a woman out of Kane County who was just moving across town and it was the dead of winter and she's like, I moved to my new apartment, I was opening up my DVDs and CDs and putting them away and she had several brown marmorated stink bugs that were overwintering in her previous apartment inside these boxes that she had packed up to move. So we're like, okay, this is, you know, it's here and it's here to stay. And since then we've... Uh, Later that spring, we had Champaign and McLean counties, which was downstate as well. And since then, we've started keeping track of our distribution of brown marmorated stink bug within the state. And that's why I wanted to hear, you know, if you guys have had any in your area. Because even though I do trapping all over the state, um, yep, 100% of our findings have come from the public reporting them. So, um, we do a lot of um, education and outreach. This is a pest that um, this past year was in our first detector workshops around the state. <coughs> Excuse me. Because of that very fact is that I can trap everywhere. You know, I could get, you know, more, well, we do have more than 100 traps out around the state, but we could hit every county with lots of different traps, but there's more of you than there is of me. So hopefully with this presentation, I'll give you a little bit um, better indication of what to look for and how to report it. But um, when you look at where this is in Illinois, our highest populations are up here in the Chicagoland area and also down here in the East St. Louis, um, St. Clair, Madison County area. And quite honestly, I get more phone calls out of this area. Um, particularly this last fall, we actually had populations high enough where they are um, congregating on the sides of houses. And I haven't had that kind of call out of um, here in the northeastern part of the state yet. So something fun to look forward to if you, you know, can imagine. But um, we highly suspect that it's in many more areas than what I show here. Um, but it's just a matter of getting an official sample or official photograph that I can um, get that positively confirmed and then um, recorded. So what we have is this, you know, stink bug. It's brown. And so you might look at it at first glance and say, you know, it looks like every other brown bug feeding on a plant. Um, but what we like to do, particularly when we did our first detector trainings, is I want you guys to focus on three um, characteristics um, that will hopefully help you identify brown marmorated stink bug. And when I get a sample in, I always um, go to the antennae first. 
And with brown marmorated stink bugs, um, they're going to have antennae that are alternating um, brown or blackish, brown and black, or brown or blackish and white. So it's going to have that alternated banding across the antennae. And hopefully, if you're sending me a sample, you're sending it in more than just an envelope because I'm not sure if you guys are aware, <laughs> those do not tend to make it through the mail or the post office very well. <laughs> you laugh, but I would say 20% of the samples I receive come in crumbles. Yes, which is really bad because I had one sample that's not necessarily brown marmorated stink bug related, but it was from a gentleman who thought he had a bug in his potato chip bag. And he sent the potato chip and the bug in a flat envelope. And I'm just like, as far as I can tell, this is just a burnt potato chip. So lesson learned, you know, we try to promote good um, sample submission. But the very next thing that I look for, uh, you know, is antennae. And then I look at the shoulders. And we use the term shoulder very loosely because for general public, that is a much easier term to understand. So... Um, the shoulder, if you will, on a brown marmorated stink bug is very smooth. There's no ridges, there's no spines, it's just a smooth like the edge of a paper. You also notice um, on a brown marmorated stink bug, on the edge of the abdomen, there's distinct black and white um, pattern, almost triangle shaped um, in that um, vicinity or um, pattern around the abdomen. So of those three things, we look at the antennae, then the shoulder, then um, the banding around the abdomen. Sometimes you are um, completely able to um, see the smooth shoulder without the aid of, of a lens or a microscope once you have looked at enough of them. Although, you know, it always does come in handy if you have a little lens to look at as well. Of the samples that I get, or the most common um, lookalikes that are confused with brown marmorated stink bug is our common brown stink bug, which we have very readily here in the state of Illinois. And um, very similar in appearance, it's maybe not um, as speckled or marmorated, but that is not a um, characteristic you can really go by. So what we want to do is we start at the antennae, and the antennae of a common brown stink bug is not going to have that distinct black and white banding. Um, it could be brown fading into like a yellow or orange. Um, and then when you look at its shoulder, it has like a little sawtooth edge to it. It's very rough and um, very distinct. Um, you'll notice that it does have some um, pattern around its abdomen, although it doesn't form that perfect triangle, and that it cannot be the only characteristic you use to identify or separate between a common stink, brown stink bug and a brown marmorated stink bug. We also have a spine soldier bug that we find um, fairly readily in the state of Illinois. This is actually a good guy. Um, we want him around. His antennae are very pale, orangish colored, maybe even like a light tan in color. Um, you'll see that the shoulders come to a distinct point. Um, and while you do have um, some banding around the abdomen, if you flip this guy over, he's going to have a little spine underneath on his belly. That's what helps him hold on to the other insects or the soft bodied insects that he feeds upon. Our other most two common submitted samples that are being commonly confused with brown marmorated stink bug here in the state is a western conifer seed bug and also a squash bug. And these are a little bit more elongated in their shape. Stink bugs have that um, pentagon type shape where these are more longer, more oval. You'll see some similarities in um, around the abdomen, but you know, they do not have the banding and they don't have that broad shoulder that you would find in a stink bug. Is everybody with me so far? Do you feel confident that I could send you samples or you could come work for me? No. Okay, I'll keep going then. <laughs> so once we want to kind of know what a uh, brown marmorated stink bug looks like, you know, during what time of year, what are you going to find? And quite honestly, you're most likely going to find an adult. The adults are present almost year round. You can find them anytime, anywhere. And that's good because quite honestly, if you want to try to search for eggs or nymphs, um, 
almost impossible to separate them from any other, you know, eggs you find on a leaf or stink bug nymphs that are crawling around. But overall, um, they overwinter um, as adults. And what they do is they overwinter in nice, dry places. Our houses, our garages, our basements, barns, you know, things where they can just get into and seek shelter for the winter. And they're going to spend the winter there. And when things warm up in um, late April, early May, they venture back out. And then um, during the summertime, they're going to mate, they're going to lay eggs, and those nymphs are going to go through about five different molts is what they believe. In our area, we feel we're only going to have one generation of round marmorated stink bug in the state of Illinois. Down south, um, they think they may have two, maybe three, if it gets really, really warm. The warmer it is, the faster the life cycle. Um, then starting in September, when things start to cool down, host plants are not as readily available. They go back in search of um, a nice place to overwinter. And it's usually in the spring or in the fall when we get most of our reports from homeowners or the general public that see them out and about. We do get the occasional reports during the summer, um, particularly from gardens where they think maybe their squash bugs that they have in their garden are actually round marmorated stink bugs, but probably 90% of our reports come between September, November, and April and May. There we go. And this is why we hate them so much. <laughs> Think multicolored Asian lady beetle or box elder bugs and more than double, more than triple, more than quadruple it. Because literally out in the mid-Atlantic states, there are hundreds of thousands of these that are living in attics. Yeah. And you know they're called stink bugs for a reason, right? Yes. So we have the congregation pheromone. They also emit that smell um, when they're disturbed or stepped on or whatnot. Um, and they are. They're looking for um, nice little places to get into your home and um, stay for the winter. So when it was reported back in 19 in Pennsylvania, they're like, you know, no big deal. And then it started invading homes and things like that. And so it really started to take notice or they start to take notice of you know this is really more than just a random pest that we've found well this is a picture out of collinsville this winter we went down there for our very first first detector workshop um, back in january and i'm in the hotel room the night before and the picture's so small you can't see it but i'm going over my presentation on stink bugs <laughs> do you know that crawled across the bed and like you, know, you can't really make this stuff up <laughs> but you know and a, as a true entomologist I didn't kill it I captured it <laughs> um, but um, it just goes to show that they are going to show up in the most unlikely places but you know it's actually going to be more than a nuisance pest and um, they really started to take note um, back in about 2009. You know, they're like, you know, this is, you know, it's been in our homes and our houses, um, but it started showing up in their commercial peach and apple orchards and causing lots and lots of injury. Um, back in 2010, or then again in 2010, they started noticing it in more than just their orchards, corn, soybeans, tomatoes. Um, peppers. Um, it was everywhere. And it wasn't just feeding a little, it was feeding a lot. And if you start looking at the apple industry out of the mid-Atlantic states, since that time, um, you're talking millions of dollars lost um, due to feeding by the brown marmorated stink bug. Um, but it feeds on more than just your agricultural crops. Um, your corn soybeans. It also feeds, feeds on, you know, your fruits, your vegetables. And also, um, they're finding out that it's going to be a potential threat to both our ornamental um, trees and shrubs, which is why I'm here to tell you more. But um, it easily switches hosts, so it's going to readily move between all of those. And there's 
over 200 potential hosts that it can feed on. Now, with um, its potential injury, it has that piercing sucking mouth part like other stink bugs, it's going to insert its mouth parts into its host plant. It emits that enzyme to help um, the tissue become more digestible and it sucks the juices back out. So you can see why um, it could cause lots of different types of injury depending upon the host plant. If we look at injury on um, peaches and apples, ultimately it's going to result in unmarketable fruit. And it doesn't have to be just in orchards, it can be in trees in your backyard or your backyard garden for all of these. Um, feeding where they um, insert the beak results in dimpling of the fruit from the outside and then when you slice it open um, it leaves this corky um, matter if you will within the apple itself. So if by chance you know some of these pass you know, maybe it's just fed upon a little, passes inspection, you know, like, you know, it'll be okay. What they're finding is, is that a lot of these apples go into cold storage for several months and they bring them out and then you start cutting them open and it's completely brown on the inside. So it is um, a huge, huge problem in both the apple and peach industries. Um, vineyards, the wine industry in Illinois is um, growing very rapidly, actually. And um, it loves grapes. You can see where um, it causes that indentation. But they're also looking at, you know, when you harvest grapes, they're grabbing clusters. And so there could be stink bugs within the clusters as well. So you're looking at possible contamination of wine or, you know, is it gonna affect the flavor or its ability to be bottled? Um, also look at things like pears and you see how disformed they can get when you have um, a lot of feeding occurring on it. Um, you look at things like tomatoes, um, peppers, um, other garden type um, vegetables. You know, I know tomatoes not really a vegetable; it's a fruit, right? But I've been corrected more than once. It's okay. But it um, causes distortion, and it's also like on these peppers. You can see it kind of gives it like a cloudy um, spot on it. Um, you start talking about agricultural settings. Um, soybeans are taking a really big hit um, in the southeast from the brown marmorated stink bug. And what they're finding is that there's edge effects. And so um, they're looking at how brown marmorated stink bugs are attracted to certain trees. And you see more um, damage along the edges of soybeans and it's causing a stay green effect. So it'll affect harvest timing. But then they're also feeding on um, flowers as well as pods within this, and then they can feed directly through the pods into the soybeans themselves. And it'll either cause the pod to abort the soybeans. And if it does happen to not abort the soybeans, you can see how um, they tend to be shriveled and you have all this um, scarring and black tissue. Corn, in Illinois we deal a lot with corn. Um, but it's not only field corn, you know, that we deal with, but also sweet corn. Um, they like to feed directly through the husks. And so it's going to cause, um, it'll affect pollination. It'll feed on directly on kernels. So here we have field corn that's affecting the quality of the kernel itself. And then here on sweet corn, you can see how the ear doesn't fill completely out. And as another um, fresh market um, produce, you can see how this would not sell well. Um, other than the fact, too, that, you know, the rest of the ear is not very good to eat as well. But, you know, I know you guys are dying to hear more about how it's going to affect trees. So I'm going to be right up front with you. There's not a lot of information yet, but there is so much research that's going on um, looking at um, trees as potential host plants and how it's affecting them um, either as a host plant or trees that are nearby agricultural settings um, where there's um, significant feeding going on. So we know that brown marmorated stink bug is going to thrive on lots of different types of plants. Um, so not only are they going to feed there, they're also going to lay their eggs there. Um, so ornamentals are going to face some of the same risks as our fruit and vegetables and agricultural crops. I've already told you that 
brown marmorated stink bug emerges um, early in the spring or you know, becomes more active early in the spring on warm sunny days. There's not a lot of fruits, vegetables, agricultural produce, if you will, available for them to feed on. What is out there? Flowering trees and shrubs. Maybe there's some fruit on these trees. Um, so what they're finding is that trees, shrubs, other ornamentals that are near these overwintering sites are prime locations to observe early season activity. And what they're finding is that the taller the tree, the more um, stink bugs there have been noticed on there. They're also going to be more um, on the sunny side of a tree because they're there warming themselves, checking things out, you know, just enjoying a bright sunny day, much like the college kids do at the University of Illinois campus. <laughs> it's true. The first warm sunny day, they all break out their shorts and flip-flops and head to the quad. So think of brown marmorated stink bugs in the spring as those college kids that are just getting out and getting warm and you'll know exactly where to look for them. But, thank you, thank you, <laughs> I appreciate that. <laughs> um, as we progress into summer, the, host, the numbers of host plants that are available increases and that's when they start moving around and they're actually checking out different things that they could feed on. So, ornamental injury is um, different from what we see in agricultural crops and you know we're not thinking of trees in terms of as a food source for us um, but more in terms of an aesthetic value or even other environmental benefits that these are giving um, our community. In brown marmorated stink bugs what they're going to do is they do have the potential to feed on leaves and when they feed on leaves um, what they do is they cause some discoloration or maybe even something like spotting on those leaves and it's not very obvious. Um, you look at things like this and this looks like little scratches and you look at like little spots like this where stink bugs have fed. Now um, if you're dealing with trees that may have some fruit with them they um, may also be discolored maybe a little deformed you may see that dimpling like we would in apples or peaches or pears or even tomatoes. One of the biggest things, and this picture blows my mind every time I um, use this in a presentation. This is a tree trunk, these are brown marmorated stink bugs, and here they are feeding through the bark of the tree. It's impressive, is it not? I mean, the fact that something that you know I could very easily snap if I wanted to can puncture tree bark. What they do or the effects of them feeding on tree bark is unknown right now. Um, we do know that they're feeding the phloem and when every time they puncture the tree bark you're opening it up. You're maybe causing wounding or wet spots and you know what happens when we open up something on a tree. I think Stephanie gave us some pretty good examples you know with for pathogens being able to enter more easily. More than that, we don't know if it has the ability to vector other types of diseases. Um, but the more feeding, the more wet spots or wounding, we're increasing the stress on the tree, much like you have with other insects that feed on trees. And so there's a lot of research going on right now looking at where this type of feeding is taking us. You know, this pest has been around, you know, not that long, you know. I mean, we look at some of the research that you showed and how long it's taken for Dutch elm disease to get information of. So we're looking at a very short time span of really only like 10 years of what we've been able to um, find out from brown marmorated stink bug. And a lot of it has been focused on um, the corn, the soybeans, those um, fruit and vegetable crops. And so now they're starting to look at what is this effect on the surrounding landscape um, in these areas. They really believe that the feeding on the trunks is going to be um, the biggest concern and you can't see this well but the whole um, underside of this trunk is covered with brown marmorated stink bugs and so if you're looking at you know a couple hundred stink bugs each one of them 
feeding on the tree, um, it's really opening it up to a potential of a lot of different problems. Um, so when populations are high, particularly, you know, in areas like the mid-Atlantic states right now, um, what are we going to see years down the road in those areas? And so to date, they've not had any known economic loss in ornamental trees or shrubs um, due to brown marmorate stink bug. And they've also not had any known um, chemical control needed to deal with any um, brown marmorate stink bug issues in those areas on trees. <clears throat> so we don't know a lot, but we do know some. And so these are um, becoming very um, good, solid building blocks for some research that's going on right now. And um, we do know that for the most part, brown marmorated stink bug is not overwintering in our landscape plants or nurseries. I mean, the majority of the population is overwintering with us. There is um, some research that's being done um, looking at um, the natural landscape as an overwintering site. And they're looking at trees that maybe have loose bark, maybe under litter um, um, within the forest. But, you know, the colder the winter, the, you know, the survivorship isn't as good. And I think what they found is maybe like 3%. They were able to cover 3% of the population in a certain research study, which isn't a whole lot. So our ornamental trees and shrubs are most likely to be um, at risk in that spring when they're moving um, out of our homes um, and looking for those host sites. And those that are closest to the overwinter sites are most at risk. Um, we talked about, you know, ones that expose them to the sun and also, um, you know, they tend to have more on them if they're taller than the ones that are lower to the ground. We know that brown marmorated stink bug does have some host preferences. Um, and that's certain species and cultivars. Um, one of the best um, one-stop shops for brown marmorated stink bug information is stopbmsb.org. Um, and on that, um, they have a um, listing of host plants. Um, and this has been um, gathered by um, several different um, universities and researchers. And so there's actually a huge working group of people um, looking at um, different aspects of brown marmorated stink bug research. And there's several that are looking at host preferences. Um, we know that plants with fruiting bodies, those with buds and pods tend to be um, more desirable than those that um, don't have those structures. And there's also host plants that are more desirable at certain times of the growing season. So some of their tree favorites and this is based on those that have the highest densities um, from this compiled list from several different states. Um, tree of Heaven, Catalpa, Eastern Redbud, Crabapple, Princess Tree, um, Japanese Flowering Cherry, and English Holly seem to be the highest at their list, or highest for densities based on this list. But there's actually lots and lots of different host plants, and some of the ones um, that would follow um, these um, main players, if you will, would be things like maple and chestnut and birch, oak and dogwood, um, sycamore, black walnut and elm, along with lots and lots of others. I just picked a handful to show you today. Um, so you can see, you know, there's been evidence of brown marmorated stink bug feeding on lots of different trees and many of them are very common in our landscape. But I bring with me good news because they also like to feed on invasives. And um, I need to talk with Chris Evans. He's our um, invasive plant person that um, I work with quite frequently. And I think he's going to be very excited about this slide that I can show him, you know, dealing with things of oriental bittersweet, butterfly bush, and autumn olive. You know, could this be um, a solution to some of our invasive plant problems? Probably not, but, you know, we like to have that little glimmer of hope, you know, to share. Calorie pear, multiflora rose, honeysuckle, all, you know, veins of our existence at different times. Oh, those should have popped up with that. So lots of different invasive plants that also are a host to brown marmorate stink bug. 
Um, brown marmorous stink bug exhibits what we call resource tracking. So, you know, we can follow its movement based on, you know, the host plants that it's moving to. It likes to move to different host plants at different times of the year. So that's going to um, play a huge part in learning more about how it's moving throughout the growing season and different types of host plants that it's um, feeding on. And um, it also could open the doors um, to some different management techniques um, in ornamentals as well. Um, some other future and ongoing research. Um, <clears throat> Um, there's a couple different studies that are looking at woody ornamentals and cultivars that maybe um, show some type of resistance or lesser susceptibility um, than some of the other plants that we have seen. Um, a couple, there's a grad student um, that's working on some landscape design um, uh, aspects of this and could we work at designing brown marmorated stink bug out of some of our landscapes based on um, planting, <clears throat> excuse me, different ornamentals that do not attract the insect? Um, we look at um, the impact to the nursery industry, and um, I'm talking with the Department of Ag Nursery Inspectors tomorrow about some of this as well. And this is, you know, the nursery ind industry is a huge part of our state as well. And um, I forget the percentage of nurseries that are within the Chicagoland area in comparison to the rest of the state. So they need to um, take things into consideration for these nurseries. Um, there's certain trees you don't want to actually place near agricultural settings because they'll be more easily to move. Could we plant different borders around the nurseries to help um, delay potential infestation or um, things like that? Um, monitoring and trapping is something that I do on a daily basis for most of the year. And we've, we've trapped for brown marmorated stink bug um, for quite some time. And we've never caught a brown marmorated stink bug in a trap. It's, it's crazy. Um, you know, we have a lure based on a pheromone plus a floral scent, but they're not, they are attracted to it, but unless populations are high enough, you're not really... Um, getting a whole lot from that but you know out east they have that's a very successful um, trapping um, for that um, in terms of management for homes exclusion is our primary you know that's what we preach all the time you need to caulk your windows make sure everything's sealed up some things people don't think about um, protecting their chimney because it could come down we never ever ever recommend the use of pesticides in homes um, with foggers. Um, we always recommend, you know, using a vacuum. Some people like to drop them into warm soapy water. Some people like to pay their kids, you know, a dime for every one. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Luckily, we don't have them because I'd be broke. My kids, my kids love doing stuff like that, which is great, but, you know. Um, in terms of agricultural settings or gardens, um, there's a lot of different research going now. Could you use um, physical barriers, um, either row covers um, over the top of um, some of your smaller plants? Could you use sticky barriers around tree trunks? There's not a lot with that right now. Um, we primarily use traps for monitoring purposes, although some people do try to use um, some light traps within their homes to try to get them to one area, which it does work if we think back to the Drury Inn in Collinsville. Um, in my attempt, you know, take a picture, then bag it, I lost it. <laughs> and you think I'd be able to find it, but I couldn't. So I just left the bathroom light on overnight. And sure enough, when I woke up the next morning, there it is. So they're attracted to lights. You can use light as a way to trap them out of, you know, a home or an enclosed area. Um, trap crops, um, maybe um, successful. They're looking at um, buckwheat and I think sunflowers. Um, in the south is potential. Um, one of our biggest things is organic growers. There's not really anything labeled for control and um, they're looking at a lot of different um, methods in order to um, not use pesticides. Um, you could also potentially use um, earlier maturing crops as a sink um, to keep them away from some of your others. Of course, um, pesticides and biopesticides, there's lots of different research going on right now 
on what to use, when to use, how much to use. Um, these guys are very resilient. Um, you can come through, spray soybeans, and three hours later, they're back. So um, they really are going to be an issue. There's been um, lots of research looking at parasitic wasps. Um, that's still in its very early stages. Um, we've found um, three, different, three different species of the native um, Asian wasps. That's a, a parasite of the brown marmorated stink bug here in the U.S. And they're looking at um, the different options that um, that may hold for us.